Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three supplements for Shadow Dark. The first is Life Paths. The second is Smoke and Steel, an Industrial Age supplement for Shadow Dark RPG, and Darker Shadows by Tom Wilson. These are all three for Shadow Dark. They're all varying sizes. Uh, this one's 20 pages, this one's 8, and this one's 91, by far the biggest. I wanted to cover these three because there are a lot of Shadow Dark materials out there right now. Tons and tons and tons of stuff. Like, I went on DriveThruRPG and just the number of, like, one-off products that are a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, it's kind of absurd. Especially since, I'm just going to be honest here, a lot of that stuff is pretty bad. So, there's just a lot of stuff out there. I've talked about this in other videos before, but when Shadow Dark came out, its ease of use and the ability of people to, like, just you know, modify their 5e stuff and, and make it Shadow Dark and put the little name on it and throw it out there. It was kind of crazy. So when I come across a, sh a supplement for Shadow Dark that I think is really good, um, I, I, I grab onto it <laughs> because, you know, there's a lot of bad, a lot of bad ones out there. Now, there's also a, a different category of Shadow Dark supplements, which is stuff that just gives you tons of power creep, like just, you know, moves the game back towards 5e in terms of the power level of stuff. And you know, that's something that I definitely don't want to do in my games. So when I'm looking at a supplement, I have to keep kind of both of those things in mind. Is this totally worthless? Sometimes it is. And is it power creep to the point where I'm not going to want to use it at my table? And sometimes it is. Well, these three supplements, in my opinion, are neither of those categories. These are both excellent supplements. They do supplemental material right. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a sort of power level changes according to these documents. Certainly, life paths gives you more power in an interesting way. And it's not going to work for every table. The kind of table that's going to do Shadow Dark funnels that treat Shadow Dark characters kind of like DCC characters or OSC characters where they're kind of just, you know, here today, gone the next. Um, probably not going to need to use Life Paths. Because what Life Paths is, this first document, is it gives you a really a much more, pretty rapidly generated, but a much more interesting and detailed background to your character with mechanical benefits that come along with it. One of the reasons I like this so much is that it reminds me of the Hero Builder's Guidebook, which was a splat book for the third edition of D&D. I loved that book. That was something I grew up with. And, and in the background of that, while there weren't mechanical benefits that went along with it, not necessarily, there were just ways of generating what had happened to your character before they became an adventurer. Random tables for that sort of thing. And so I really like books like that. One of the reasons why, I forget which book it was, maybe it was um, Xanathar's Guide to Everything for 5e. It had a nod to that, and there was a whole section of the book where you could kind of develop a background in a bit in a bit more detail, and I liked that. I didn't like a lot of else about those books, those supplemental books for 5e, but I did like that. So I have an affinity for things like Life Paths, and I think this is a really well-executed version. So I'm going to go through it in a bit of detail, and I'll talk about the other two as well. Now note that they don't all make things better for the players, <laughs> as we're going to see Darker Shadows, the third supplement I'm looking into, is specifically kind of like Shadow Dark hard mode, or <laughs> it's a possibility of making things even harder for the players, um, which is cool. So again, these aren't all just moving in one direction in terms of power creep. Let's go through life paths, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So you have, uh, this is written in, and designed by Daniel James, um, and uh, Burning Light Press is the, uh, the uh, publisher here. What you have is, you know, 84, well, more than that, 91 pages. But as you can see, they're broken into the basic classes from the game. Wizard, Fighter, Priest, Thief, Bard, Ranger, then you get Witch, Warlock, Knight, Shaman, and Hero. So those are um, supplemental, right? You get them, you know, they're, they're related to things from Curse Scroll 1 and uh, perhaps other, other supplements as well. So let's go through them. And uh, you get the concept, the design, the use, and the balance of this game. And, and as he says here, Life paths will change base character abilities. Most paths, even if filled with mostly successful events, should only increase a character's abilities the equivalent of about one level. So that's that's the thing, right? If you're concerned about the balance of an outcome, simply change it. Effects can be altered, but success or failure should stand. So this is something that, um, you know, it's going to change your game in, in the direction of stronger characters. It's going to. But... If you want a more story-based... So, I'll give you... like I'm not going to use this in my current Shattered Dark game, but if I were to go back and run Curse of Strahd again, I would do something like this. If you want a more narrative-heavy game using the Shattered Dark structure, then this is a game for you. Um, all right. Uh, now, there's also an interesting point here is that you could use this as sort of like a reward. He, he makes uh, a note of saying, you know, 
at level one, you're probably not going to want to do this because your character is just brand new. But if they survive to level three or four, then maybe you could do this as like a reward, right? As like they get you get to know your character a bit better. So here's what you do. Wizard's path. You start off with this for your players, right? Choose a path. Wild magic or learned arcana. So let's say you picked wild magic, okay? Your childhood seemed unremarkable until one cold spring morning when everything changed. Event A. A boar charged you down as you walked through the nearby woods. A surge of arcane power saving you from death. Or... Event two, while climbing a roof, you slipped and fell. With eyes shut, you expected to hit the ground. Instead, you were floating above it. Or three, your dreams were always strange, but it was only when they began coming true that you discovered your powers. So you pick an event, and then you roll. D6, one, two, and three is misfortune. Four, five, and six is a success. So let's say you rolled um, a success on the boar. You hold your nerve and release a bolt of magic, perfectly killing the boar. You hold faith in your abilities, quick to act, and true in aim. If you roll a one through three, it's you miss. With the bolt of energy striking the nearby tree, the board scared off. Unluckily, a flying splinter hits your eye, blinding it. All right, so let's move to page six. All right, so that was that was the result there. You have a blind eye. The years pass with your natural abilities growing each day. Once again, however, your life forks. Choose a path. Right, controlling nature or unshackled power. Let's go with one B. This is your adolescence. Why halt the progress of power that courses through you so freely? It matters not whether it comes from nature, fate, or the gods you were chosen to wield it. No, restraint is for the weak. You dive into what is offered headfirst, unrestrained by fear or caution. And then bend A. The inner flame that burns within is only fed by releasing your control over it, letting yourself go. Or, event B, it is your emotions that feed the arcane fire within you. Powerful, raw, and deep emotions. Roll D6. Let's say you picked emotions. Let's say you failed. Uh, on a two through three. Misfortune, you lose control, letting emotions over, uh, envelop you. Your rage, however, only hampers your ability to think. You cannot read and cast scrolls while engaged in combat. That's rough. That's a downside. But if you had succeeded there, is you gain advantage on your next spell against a creature that has injured you. Okay, so that's a, a risk that you could get. You could just make it so you can't cast scrolls or read while you're engaged in combat. That's, that's pretty rough. Right? That's pretty rough. Then it says head to page 7 and read 1 C, D, or E, choosing a new path. Which one? Well, let's say you heard, uh, you got a late start. Let's pick 3. This is young adulthood. While your arcane strength was never in doubt, your ability to shape magic into what you desire is poor at best. Raw power is of little use with no training to harness it. As such, you decided to go in search of a formal knowledge, even if a bit odd. And let's say it was event A. You go in search of a school to learn from better late than never. So you roll a d6, and let's say you get a 4. While older than most, you find a school that takes you on, allowing you to learn uh, f uh, to learn of magic formally. Run events to A or B, then to C, D, E. Your life path ends with you much older. Okay, so now you have to go to 2 C, D, or E, or 2 A or B, and then to C or D. Right? So you have to go through this, learn arcana. And then, um, and then you get the results. Now, again, one of the fails on that one was DC 17 to learn a new spell. You get your new spells as you level up, but to learn them from scrolls and stuff, DC 17. That's really, really hard. Right? That's really, really rough. But um, that's pretty cool. So you see what you get. Your character is slightly different. They're going to have some benefits. They're going to have some drawbacks. Because you're probably not going to get the, the same, the best results each time. You might, but you might not. So you have to think of these as, you know, real risks and rewards for your players. I think it's really cool. Notice that they're not all hyper-powered. In fact, they're not really hyper-powered at all. They're, they're pretty manageable in terms of power level. They give you advantage or plus two or, or on the other hand, minus one constitution or a DC 17 to learn a new spell. Plus two intelligence or any one use fail as a critical fail. So this is really rough. And if you use this, it's gonna be a very different kind of character you get than the standard Shadow Dark characters. But I think a lot of players really like the idea of giving their your characters more flavor. And in a game where your characters are pretty random already, throwing this in there, it seems to me it leans more into something like the DCC, you know, um, Mercurial Magic Tables. Now, obviously it's not to the same degree at all, but adding another element of individuation for each character is cool. And again, this is just with the wizard. And you get some tables at the end, of course. Uh, alternate or additional way of rolling life paths you can just roll through, right? Out, roll outcomes for childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood. Um, 
and some of them are really hard, right? You trespassed into a cursed realm. All spells DC are one tier higher. Or you successfully deciphered an ancient tome, gaining an additional tier two spell at level one. That's crazy. Some of them are just story-based. Your mentor turned out to be in league with necromancers and was burnt alive. Well, that's going to have a major effect on your character. So I think that's all really, really interesting. Then you get the fighter's path is one of blood and violence. You get the same thing. Noble birth, common soul, or inner rage. You get your path. Protector, aggressor, or trainer. Guild, hunter, or mercenary. A giant foe, greater evil, or endless slaughter. Ancient relic, physical perfection, or weapon master. Right? You get some fighter tables. A uh, priest's path is one of holy righteousness. You get the same thing here. Priest tables. Thief's path is one of shadows and skullduggery. I really like this stuff. Now, obviously, this is not something you have to do for your game. Obviously not. And it's one of those things where people are going to say, no, one of the things I like about Shadow Dark is how quickly and how, like, neutrally, right, I can develop these characters such that they're just kind of nobodies. I don't have to know a whole bunch about them. I can just jump right in and just have my character, you know, rolled randomly if I wanted, uh, which is a pretty easy thing to do based on the, the base book. I don't want to get to know them really detailed at level one, maybe not even past that. And or I don't want the, you know, some characters to have this major benefit and or a major downside. Just to start off, this guy's weaker than everybody else. Well, you kind of have that already with the way that Shadow Dark rolls your stats. But this is just taking that and turning it up, which is why I like it. I like it because it's not simply a power creep. What it is, is taking the Shadow Dark randomness and turning it up. If you want an even more randomized character with more power in some areas, less power in others, randomly determined because it's a D6 roll. There's nothing you can do to change that. You can make some pet choices as a player, but the results are totally random. Um, well, that's, that's that. I like that. And I think it lends itself to a certain kind of, um, or rather it builds on one of the elements of Shadow Dark. Right, this is not the sort of thing you could do with a 5e character. And what I mean by that is, if you did this sort of random 5e stuff, this sort of, and, and you know, you made it equivalent to the 5e level, it wouldn't work out. Because suddenly 5e is the power fantasy. And if you randomly started with a massive drawback in your character, it would be so hard and to fit with the philosophy of, the, of most tables. Right? There are some people who play 5e much more old school, and I totally get that. But for most people, they're not going to want to use a book like this. They, they, you know, first of all, there's a certain sort of balance that's required in 5e. I, I mean amongst the players. That's certainly not the case in Shadow Dark. So, anyway, this is really, really cool. Also, you can just pick a hero's path if you want to do the hero's path. It's sort of more generic, right? Any, any... Um, hero tables that you can just if you if you just want another kind of table as opposed to your class table you might be able to roll on this and that's it 91 pages of tables with some great art in there i have to say i, I kind of just passed over that but i like a lot of these character pieces um so life paths shadow dark supplement i'll put links below to where you can get it is everybody going to want this no absolutely not is everybody going to like this no absolutely not this is not a free product you have to pay for this so there are people who are going to be like, nah, I'm not interested in paying, I think it's $7, uh, at least right now, $7 for um, for a 91-page document that goes through a bunch of stuff I, I don't want my players to have. Fine, fair enough, totally. <laughs> I like this. And I think a lot of players, a lot of DMs are going to like this, especially if, you had, um, especially if you've had trouble with your players initially kind of settling into the lack of builds that Shadow Dark has. Now, th what this does is it doesn't provide a whole bunch of feats or skills or choices to make that give your character a whole bunch of new abilities. It's not that sort of build, right? It's not that sort of direction. Rather, this is leaning into what makes Shadow Dark different than 5e, what makes Shadow Dark different than a lot of other games, which is that randomness uh, at low level. Um, I mean, it's similar to other OSR games, certainly, but different than 5e. Um, and doesn't try to, it doesn't try to move itself back to 5e. That's what I've often seen with a lot of these supplements and why I don't like many of them, is that they just end up doing things like that 5e players expect, right? That's not what this does. This builds on the randomness of Shadow Dark and says, hey, we're going to double down on it. <laughs> for better and for worse. So, if you like that, cool. I recommend this highly. If you don't like that, no worries. I wouldn't go for it. Uh, the next 
uh, document is Smoke and Steel. This is a free supplement or pay what you want over on itch.io, I think. I'll put the link below to where you can get it. I don't remember if it's actually on itch or... or um, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive it's on itch. Smoke and Steel, an industrial aid supplement for Shadow Dark RPG. Now, this is definitely power creep in one direction because you're dealing with guns. You're dealing with... It basically it's how to set Shadow Dark in an industrial age with the basic gear... And instead of doing armor, which I think this is really cool, instead of using armor, you get this idea of defensive training. So you can still have players who have better training than others. Right? So you can still have the equivalent of a fighter as a tank-ish without the kind of breaking verisimilitude of an industrial age guy in plate mail. Right? I think that's pretty cool. So, again, you don't have to... You certainly don't have to use this, but it's a different way of doing the game. Now, this obviously is power creep because this doesn't take up gear slots and it doesn't impose movement restrictions, as it says here. On the other hand, that means that a lot of the NPCs that you're going to be interacting with are going to have a higher AC than they might in Shadow Dark because you're going to run into a lot more people with basic or advanced uh, defense training, right? Um, but it's also worth noting here that you don't get plate. You, don't get, you just get 10, 11, or 12. So the basic are uh, no armor, leather armor, or chain. Right, that's what you get here. Uh, you also get the industrial age weapons, how much they cost in industrial age terms, um, and also just their abilities. Now, this is what I used uh, on some level. I used some of these as the basis for my firearms in my Curse of Strahd game. But obviously, this goes beyond that. Uh, grenades and submachine guns and, you know, all these all these things. S uh, sabers and katanas. katanas. Um it's going to change the kind of game you're playing if you play with firearms. I, I used it in Curse of Strahd. I really liked it. It's not going to work for most games. So the Industrial Age supplement, most people aren't going to use this. But if you if you decided you wanted to do it, I think this is a great way of doing it. Um, you know, the submachine gun's pretty strong. It's two-handed, two slots, burst fire, point blank, and has recoil three. <laughs> uh, it's $26 also, which is quite expensive. You also get a handful of new classes for this system. You get the Envoy... You get the Inquisitive, you get the Galvanist, and then you get their gadgets. That's class and ancestry equivalents. I'm going to go back to the Envoy for a minute here. You get the weapons, that they're, uh, weapons defensive training, and their hit points. Um, delegation. In lieu of your movement this turn, you may choose one creature close to you. They may take an action as if it was their turn. It's a really powerful ability. Really powerful ability, especially if you have a caster. So if you're playing with a mix of classes... Right, the ability to cast two spells in a turn, really, really strong in Shadow Dark. So, you know, be careful about this sort of supplement. Um, again, this is definitely power creep. But I think the classes are cool. And they fit the setting. You can just use these three classes, maybe Fighter and Thief as well. Well, even Thief would be a bit much. But you could just use these with, like, Fighter and Thief in there. And you'd have, um, you know, a, certainly a different kind of game. But it would be pretty cool. I don't know. You have Organized Movement. Whenever you move and don't take an action on your turn, you can choose... Uh, any number of creatures that can then themselves move. So basically, you get to kind of control the battlefield a bit, right? And then you have diplomacy, so you have advantage on talking and things like that. So that's pretty good. You're you're there to help everybody else move and take actions. It's not going to be a class for everybody. Some players are going to hate this, but it's also a cool ability, and it doesn't step on the toes of any other class. In fact, it's just really powerful as a backup class. So it's one of those things where I think the party's power level as a whole will go wildly up if you include an envoy the player might feel a little bored in combat but shadow dark combats go pretty quick so that might not be a problem hit the inquisitive which is pretty cool right you're looking like a, a sherlock holmes or something like that right not combat have not heavily combative not many hit points you get a d4 but you get studied technique which is you can use intelligence instead of strength when making melee attacks now this is one of those things you want to be very very careful with but if you look at the weapons used it's actually not that many. Baton, knife, small sword. Because it's for melee attacks. Those are not very strong weapons. So it's not that big of a deal. Normally you want to be very careful. And again, this is why I like this class and this supplement. Um, you got to be really careful about changing the basic Shadow Dark stuff. Like what modifiers you get to use. Because there's a reason uh, for in the design philosophy for making strength the, the best you know, attack thing. This doesn't let any class do it. It's not a weapon that lets you do it. It's a class that does it for a very few base weapons. And that's one thing that I've noticed, actually. In the discussions around Shadow Dark, a lot of people don't understand that the weapon lists are actually curated pretty carefully. 
Like there's a reason why certain classes are allowed to use certain things and not others. It recently came up that someone really thought, why would you ever use a crossbow over a longbow? Because it's just a weaker gun and it has reloading. It has a weaker damage and it's reloading. Why would you ever use the other? Um, and it's because some classes just can't use the longbow, right? They can only use the crossbow. So yeah, there you go. That's why you would use it because you can't use the other one. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. Okay, and you get Battlefield Insight, which is pretty cool. Three times per day as your action, you can observe a creature's tactics, tactics and defense to find a weakness. If you succeed on your check, um, you can share it, and everybody has your intelligence added to their damage. Now, that is pretty, it's pretty strong. You do have to take an action. It's only three times per day. It's one of those things where you say, why is it only three times per day? Why is my insight only effective three times per day? Uh, I'm not sure. I might make this more of a cast to fit with the Shadow Dark idea. Like you roll, right? And you try it. And if you fail it, then you can't do it for the rest of the day, right? Maybe, maybe fit it more in with the Shadow Dark philosophy of you can do something over and over until you fail. Because that's what you see with other classes. And then you get deductive reasoning, which is a cool idea here. Um, it's one of those classes where if you have a group of players who's really interested in the role playing of things like, uh, you know, detecting, <laughs> searching for traps and all that stuff, if they don't just like rolling for it, then this class is going to be less interesting. But if, it, if, if, you just, if you have a table like, like mine where people just roll for stuff, then I think it'll be much more um, amenable, much more useful. And then you have the Galvanist, which is pretty cool. The Galvanist is this guy who uses, you know, their energy cells and oil flasks. It's very like Steam Boy rather than uh, electromagnetism, right? <laughs> rather than, um, than just like a standard... Uh, smoke and steel age, you know, um, game. Uh, but it's cool as a replacement for the wizard, I think, right? That's what you would kind of use it for. That's what I would use it for as a replacement for the wizard or, or in this world if you played a non-magical campaign. Yeah, I would use something like this. Pretty cool. Um, you have a defibrillator, which is pretty cool. Uh, you get your electrical mishaps, right? Bad things can happen there. <laughs> but then you get your gadgets on the next page and you get the, the shield, the glove, the healing pulse. Um, so you get some abilities to some gadgets to use on the battlefield. Make your guy feel like a, like a, like a caster without being magic. So that's cool. That's cool. You get some class and ancestry conversion, so what, what that would look like here. Um, and then if you wanted to use these classes in a medieval fantasy game. And then how to use ancestry in a human-only game. That's pretty cool. Um, one thing you could do is to make it cultural, right? So it's like, you know, if you're looking at the, say, setting it, playing it in a, you know, medieval Europe or something, or a, a, a you know, a, a, a uh, what's the word for like, you know the uh, uh, a industrial age? I couldn't think of the words right there. Industrial age Europe or something. You could have it be like you know England, France, and you know English, French, German. You know, have cultural talents and things like that based on or cultural abilities based on their cultures that you're coming from. So that would be one thing to do. Uh, or you can just do it here, which is kind of you get your choice. You just pick any talent you want and uh, from the from the talents in the base rules, and you get your extra languages and things like that. So that's pretty cool. Um, what I did was I just gave everybody the human talent from, which is pretty powerful when I ran an all human game, because that's what I ran for Curse of Strahd, was just everybody got the human talent and no one really complained. <laughs> they, they really liked that. So anyway, this is Smoke and Steel, an industrial age supplement for Shadow Dark. The reason I like it so much is because it goes in a different direction than standard Shadow Dark. You're not going to use this in a standard Shadow Dark game. You're going to use an entirely new thing. But if you want to use the Shadow Dark base rules, right, you want to use that core idea well, then this is a pretty cool supplement to use. Just swap out the classes for these classes, swap out the equipment list for this equipment list with, you know, a few others that you wanted, and you're set to go. All ready to go. So, smoke and steel. Again, I'll put the link below where you can get it. Finally, we'll look at Darker Shadows by Tom Wilson. Darker Shadows was included in all the PDFs that Tom sent me after I kickstarted the Slumbering City. Um, he just was very generous and just gave all of his backers everybody who backed that, just a bunch of free adventures and then this document, Darker Shadows. This is really cool. I like it a lot. 20 pages of ways to make the game harder, essentially. <laughs> That's what it is. Um, yeah, introduction and the Shadow Dark mechanics and how this does not repeat or reuse those ideas, but additional options for darkening your adventures. And in some cases, literally. So let's look at character options, level advancement. Instead of adding a talent at first level, you can force a bonus talent start at second level. Right, this is just going to make it harder, <laughs> right? Instead of getting a talent at first level, you get a talent at second. Additionally, you can increase the XP needed by level to 20 instead of 10. 
Right, so obviously you can see this is just ideas for making the game harder, right? That's what this is. Talent stat uh, gain changes, character hit point increases, adventuring rules, and how to make things harder, right? So how to regain hit points, make that harder. Lack of rest, lack of sunlight, how to make that harder. How to make searching, and this is actually a really good idea. Um, sometimes it says, you know, uh, if enough time is spent searching, you could just find something. But so how long? How long exactly? This is an idea here. If it's a DC 21, that'd be like four hours. And if it's a DC 18, it'd be two hours. DC 15, one hour, etc. I think that's pretty cool. Just as a brief, like, you know, for you, for your own purposes. If they're like, we're going to stay here until we find the thing we know is here. Great. Then I'm just going to say that this amount of time passes. If you don't feel comfortable adjudicating it on your own, which I think most of us do. But if you don't, then this is a good little guideline. Get some combat and some critical miss and success tables. Um, real good, but way closer to DCC, right? Critical misses and critical successes on regular attacks have their own tables instead of just spells. Um, so there, what you can also do instead of doing a critical success where you double one of the numerical modifiers, you can use one of these too. Making monsters melee more deadly and getting how death from wounds can, can happen more quickly. Some extra gear and torch quality untrustworthy oil vendors, weather effect on torches, cursed items, and a bunch of cool cursed items here. And some new monsters, like the Flame Wisp or the Torch Mimic, and some new spells, Darkness and Dark Step, Gloom, Cure, and Shroud, Death Sphere, and Hole of Despair. So darkness-themed spells. And then uh, this last bit of art here by Dean Spencer, which is really cool. And a thank you to everybody who backed the Slumbering City, which is what I did. So Darker Shadows, it's very short, but really cool. Highly recommended if you want your Shadow Dark games to be given a little bit more of an edge, or if you want to turn up the dial on the difficulty just a bit. Um, it's really cool for me to see supplements that make the game harder. <laughs> not because I'm going to use them all, obviously, not because I want my players to suffer, although, you know, we're all GMs, we all kind of enjoy the players having that tense horror, you know, sometimes, maybe much of the time, but because very often supplements make the game easier, right? They make the game easier for the players. You know, you see that with, like, just all the options. I mean, I'm, I'm coming from 5e, and so, you know, there's the, the, the deluge of 5e player options that was available second-party stuff that was, you know, third-party stuff, I should say, <laughs> that was just ridiculous in terms of power level and power creep and just making the game incredibly easy. It's interesting now and then to see a game which says, to see a, a supplement which says, hey, here's a way of making the game harder. Here are some rules, here are some ideas, here are some things you can do within the existing structure of the game. So what makes Shadow Dark interesting? This way of doing hit points, this way of doing uh, torches, this way of doing spells, you know, this way of doing light. Okay, let's attack the light. How could we do that in this sort of way? So really cool. I like that a lot. Darker Shadows by Tom Wilson. Highly recommend. Uh, so this has been, yeah, uh, Darker Shadows, Smoke and Steel, and Life Paths. I hope you guys have found this to be an interesting one, and I'll see you all in another video.